Welcome to the Forge by Trust podcast. I'm your host, Robin Dreek, former U.S. Marine, spy recruiter, best-selling author, and trust expert. This episode is brought to you by my guest, Eric Hunley. Eric is forging his path in unstructured interview style podcasts as the host of the Unstructured Podcast. Not surprisingly, his podcast formula is now being followed by many other fellow podcasters. The Unstructured Podcast traditionally has a gambit of unique podcast guests that are sourced from all corners of the globe. Eric has created well over 100 interview style podcasts in less than nine months. His unrelenting professionalism, detail-oriented research, and smooth delivery as a host serves as an inspiration to many. New podcasters and seasoned professionals often seek out his knowledge and advice when it comes to the business of podcasting. Check him out and his show out at erichunley.com. Coming up next on the Forge by Trust podcast. I have an intellectual curiosity and I like to learn from people. I like to live vicariously through others. I was not well liked by the cult kids either. And what was really interesting about it though is I volunteered to invade Haiti to get out of there. Right. I'm not, I, dude, I hate it. Okay. I wound up in Cuba. So nothing in my army career was straightforward. And he said, I have never seen anyone hate something as much as you do and still work their ass off. One thing I found out is everybody's awesome. Everybody has a story. They just don't know they have a story. Welcome to the show. I'm Robin Dreek. And on the Forged by Trust podcast, we decode the interpersonal communication skills of the world's most acclaimed forgers of trust. We unlock the skills and techniques from spies, spy recruiters, master interrogators, globally recognized behavioral experts, C-suite executives, entrepreneurs, acclaimed authors, and thought leaders. Each episode provides specific actions that you can immediately apply to any aspect of your personal or professional life. Today's episode, Exploring Human Behavior and Its Consequences, is with my friend, a master, unstructured interviewer and podcaster, Eric Hunley. Eric Hunley is the host of the Unstructured Podcast and YouTube channel by the same name. Eric interviews a wide variety of folks from body language experts to YouTube lawyers to folks in three-letter agencies. He can also be found on the YouTube channels America's Untold Stories, Laid Back News, and Nate and Eric. During the episode today, we talk about growing up isolated, deep curiosity, solving problems through networks, and so much more. Welcome to the show, Eric. I appreciate you taking time from your own show to come on to my show. <laughs> All right. Thanks for having me, dude. Absolutely. We've known each other a little while now. Was it pandemic? Is that when we first chatted? No. Before then, we, right? I think we might have chatted in 2018. Yeah. It's been a while. Yeah. You know, your first, I talked to you about your first book. Oh, so that, that was a while ago. So yeah, that was 2017, 2018. Yeah. The Code of Trust when it came out. Yes. Mm-hmm. That's good. So you, your backstory, your origin story, you mentioned it briefly when we were chatting the other day. I'd like to explore that a little bit because you have this thread in life. You just have all these interests. At least that's what it looks like to me. Is that true? I I have an intellectual curiosity and I like to learn from people. I like to live vicariously through others. And that's helpful. Like I can talk to you about recruiting spies. I could talk to Jack Barsky about being a spy, but guess what I don't have to do? I don't have to leave the house and actually do it. So now I've got all this beautiful experience by talking to you guys both firsthand and living vicariously, but myself, I'm just a dude up in a room, happy. So where did that all come from? I guess I've always been an outsider looking in, in in a weird way. I don't know how to put that, but I grew up in Tucson, Arizona, technically outside of town so i grew up on the northwest part of town my parents bought the land back when it was just desert so you know you had to we had to drive like 20 minutes to get to the grocery store type of Uh thing and then as i grew up the town moved out to us so then it would be like 10 minutes to the grocery store then all of a sudden there's stores north of where we were Right. Kind of crazy. But and that was after I left the house. But what happened is it happened to coincide that where they bought the land was near the Catalina foothills, which is like the nicest part of town, so to speak. And all the money moved out there. So my dad managed to get the land really, really cheap and built the house 
by hand. He was a general contractor. Oh, wow. At the time, he was a, a, a firefighter, and then he became a carpenter, but he just built the house. And one of the first things that was built was the fireplace. His uh, friend, Zeke Martinez, built this fireplace. So it was like literally a standalone fireplace. And my dad would put me, apparently, in the crib in the fireplace. And he was <laughs> there working on foundation and, and, and everything else. So he didn't have any real money when I was a kid. You know, there were times things were thin. And honestly, I can tell you what rabbit tastes like. Right. There were a lot of rabbits. So I would get a rabbit for dinner. You know, you, you get some canned veggies and uh, we'd go out and shoot a rabbit and that'd be dinner. So it was an odd experience. But then the kids I went to school with, their fathers were university pre- professors, owned the car dealership, owned like five McDonald's. All the money was saturated when I went to school. So I was the poorest kid in the richest school. I so understand this. Go ahead. (laughs) And it it is an interesting experience, not one that I recommend to most people, but it's one that if you can persevere, I think that, you know, it was probably healthy for me. Same way as the military was healthy for me, even though it started out as the worst imaginable nightmare. And that's sort of it. So I never quite fit in. And okay, other examples. I grew up raising goats. My dad would train horses and race horses. But then I have a real affinity to animals. Like I, I get along with them really well, love them dearly. I'm deathly allergic to alfalfa. Right. So it's contradictions here. Do right. you the whole thing of love the horses and I get along with them, but I can't be in their environment because I'm gagging and choking. Or I love the goats and I milk them, but then I stink like a goat when I go to school. Right. So there's this this back and forth. So because of that, I think I was always kind of isolated. But in other ways, maybe that helped me because when I was a little kid, I was very sickly, the asthma, things like that. I would wear a jacket in the middle of summer at 110 degrees. Why was that? Because I was just sick. I would be chilled. I just, you know, I didn't feel well. I had a growth spurt later, but then I was playing with the girls because I would be in a fight with any of the boys. So I wound up always playing with the girls when I was a little kid. So it's just this weird, weird paradigm. And then ultimately, you know, I grew out of some of that. You mentioned marathons. Ironically, one of the best ways to train for a marathon is to have asthma as a kid that was so bad that you'd get adrenaline shots to your chest because when you're in the late miles of a run, you know what pain is. Right. And I lived through pain, you know, the breathing pain. And I, I can't explain that to people, how, how it feels to just literally lose your breath, unless you fall off a wall or something and then you lose your breath. I don't think people really understand it. So it's, there's a weird, everything about me is a contradiction in a lot of ways. What's fascinating is everyone's born pretty healthy ish, Mm. depending on where you are in the world and everything. But then, then we all experience trauma. Mm -hmm. I, I think trauma is pretty universal for every child to go through to varying degrees. And what our surroundings allow us to do or not do during that experience kind of forms the rest of our lives. Would, were you empowered? Did you feel like you had a lot of control? I was like, all right, so you're hungry. So you go shoot a rabbit. You, you seemed like you have a lot of autonomy to do what you did. I didn't. I didn't. I mean, I didn't go shooting the rabbits for food. My dad did. Okay. And, you know, and, and there were hard lessons in life <laughs> I mean, because right. I had the affinity for animals, but I very much like meat. And right. my dad had me help him butcher a goat. And that that traumatized me, believe it or not. I was like, oh, I bet it, it disturbed the hell out of me, even though I'm not going to be a hypocrite and not say, hey, that's it's fair. And people who are hunt, that's that's uh, admirable. So, again, I don't know. I sort of I guess I had autonomy in the sense that I didn't really have friends. We lived too far away from anyone. And, uh, you know, unless my mom would take me somewhere, like when I did have friends later, they'd be about two miles away and I'd right. walk meet to, you know, two to five miles, depending. And so I would just be out, you know. Only child? No. Close, though, because 
our, I have a big age difference, seven years with my sister. So she okay. was kind of out of the house. She, I mean, she was out of the house before she hit 18. Wow. And so we both almost were only children, if that makes sense. All right. Yeah. Because you're such an age gap. Sure. Exactly. So I, it was long enough for me to make her crazy and to, you know, fight with her when I was a kid, but then she was gone and didn't really have that. So I would just be out wandering the desert, riding the bike, doing whatever. And then when I wasn't doing that reading, I, I just, you know, I wasn't really allowed to watch television. Life gets weirder. My, my mom converted to a cult religion when I was seven. And so Christmas disappeared. That's like one of those weird hangups in my life. But huh. I had Christmas until I was seven years old. Then Christmas didn't exist all of a sudden. And what's interesting about that, though, is you're talking about the independence and I'm I'm finding my way to it in a long path, obviously. Right. That's fascinating. Said, your, your mom with the cult. You're right. Yeah. And what's weird, though, is fortunately she didn't shove it too much on me and i was not well liked by the cult kids either and i guess reading stephen king in church is i think I, I'm, I'm sorry i gotta watch my laughing sometimes some people say some okay. unusual things but i think i gotta say eric that's probably one of the most unusual usual things i've heard on my show is the cult kids didn't really like me yeah. Is that a bad thing? I mean, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. They, they were actually a little creepy <laughs> anyway. So it's like, there are times I'm happy to not fit in. <laughs> wow. What kind of cult was this? And how did she get involved with it? It was called the Worldwide Church of God. And Herbert W. Armstrong, he was out of Pasadena, California. Apparently, he had a very strong internal family relationship. But from what I understand, I don't want you demonetized. Right. <laughs> but I, it was supposedly a literal interpretation of the Bible. And I mean, many of these are. Sure. David Koresh was a spinoff of Seventh-day Adventist. And this actually probably resembled Seventh-day Adventists more than many. That's why like Christmas disappeared, it's very literal, seventh day, well, Saturday is the seventh day, so that became the Sabbath, blah, blah, right. blah, 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 blah. Fortunately, though, I mean, my mom didn't quite push it that hard, in a sense, like, I, I just never got into it. How'd she get involved in that if you guys were in the middle of nowhere? I'm not really sure. Huh. I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure. And she, and she even kind of just I'm not going to say one day she just quit. She just, we just kind of didn't go. And right. My mom would always just sit at home and read the Bible. Right. And so she kind of kept it to herself. And then later on, it was crazy because as an adult, I, I'm celebrating Christmas. You know, I get married I mean, I'm with, into another family, you know, right. with my wife and her family. And then my mom's excited and gets a Christmas tree. And I'm like, wait, what? Because I also couldn't eat pork. Right. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, she'll have a piece of pork. I'm like, what the? It, it, it's like it just the world went upside down on me. It's like, oh, everything's I guess none of that happened. None of this crazy stuff in my life happened. It just we just move on. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, it's a lunatic background. It, it it it's it's fascinating because now it, I mean your your interests are are a little different. Even mm -hmm. on your podcast, I was just looking at your, your recent stuff you're doing on Marilyn Manson. <laughs> That's a little different because my experience inside the FBI compared to the stuff that fascinates you with the FBI is very different. And now it's kind of, do you think that contributed to your interest later in life? Oh, sure. Sure. I mean, obviously cults, hmm, how do you manipulate people? What is it you drive people? All that. But like the Manson stuff, I think it's hilarious because I know that it makes people uncomfortable. Why do I like Manson? Hmm. I don't necessarily like Manson. I'm not into his music that much. I'm a little old. No, I'm not older than him. He's actually within one year of my age. Uh huh. Maybe your age. I think you and I are close in age, actually. I'm yeah, how old are 52. you? Yeah, I'm 54. Well, almost 54, right? Okay, he's 53. Right. Right smack there. So I look at Marilyn Manson. I'm like, well, you know, he kind of is just a wannabe Alice Cooper, Gene Simmons, right? Because I'm his age, right. so it's like it, it is. It's hard for me to see him as Marilyn Manson, a yeah. scary rock star, because I'm like, you know, while the kids at Columbine were going crazy, I was in the army. 
you were in the Marines at one point. I mean, you hear right. me, oh, that's okay song. That's not. My thing with Manson is I like narratives where you start one story and you read it. And the story is so obviously this way, but then it's really not. Like right. Johnny Depp, well, you know, he's an actor. Sure, he'll like him on the screen, but maybe he does go home and beat his wife. Right? I mean, I don't go home with them. People have dark secrets at home. Sure. Right. It's possible. And my default behavior is to say most of the time in an abusive relationship is probably the male who is beating the female. It's just kind of in the nature. Again, most of the time, obviously there are exceptions. Well, it turns out, oh, it looks like Johnny Depp might be an exception. That's interesting. Right. But what if we can take that to like 11 if we're going to use a spinal tap measurement here. Right. And say, what if the guy who looks like Satan, who looks like the personification of evil, what if he's not guilty? Mm -hmm. Damn, that's far more interesting to me. So it's in a sense, my interest in it is more about what is the story and narrative. And I have another show I did about Tommy Morrison. And I think when you look at those two compared, you're, you'd be like, oh, now this makes sense. That's what's up with Eric. Tommy Morrison was a boxer, top of the world in Rocky Five as a star, was set to fight Mike Tyson. All of a sudden, boom, he comes up hot with an HIV test, gets suspended around the world, loses his you know license to fight, can't fight anywhere, turns to drugs, whores, all the good stuff. Life spirals down to nothing and then ultimately dies in 2013, supposedly by AIDS. That's a really tragic story. I mean, it is. It's horribly mm -hmm. tragic. But then the problem is that it's even more tragic because it turns out he never had HIV. And he mm -hmm. didn't die of AIDS. I have the pathology. I have the autopsy. No HIV no AIDS, no AIDS-related diseases. He died because of septic shock when they left one foot of gauze inside of his body after a wound. Wow. Week. Took him so, 20 months. But anyway, that, that's what I'm saying. So it's counter-narrative. Right. I term it non-judgmental curiosity to the, uh, to the sure. exponential degree. Where did this non-judgmental curiosity spring from? Do you think it was that upbringing or is it something later in life? Probably all the above. I mean, it's, you know, all of our lives are built by lessons and experiences and, and, and learning and maturity, I, I would hope. A good example, I mentioned that the Army, the worst thing, I hated the Army, hated Okay. Which is perfect. Keep diving deep on the Army, please. <laughs> oh, <there you> go. <laughs> okay. I joined the Army because unlike many, many other people, I wasn't super patriotic. I wanted a paycheck and I could, I knew I could join the army and I'd be able to have, you know, shelter food and I'd be able to get by. I mean, just very bottom line deal. Plus when I went to the recruiter, because I, I was actually trying to freelance write for the local newspapers in Kansas, nearby Fort Riley. I was like, Hmm. This isn't working. You know, 50 bucks for an article once a month when you're competing with college professors doesn't fly. All right. So even though I got picked up, you know, Kansas City Star published a piece and the local paper did a few. They were like, when did you get into writing? I've always kind of been into it. You know, someone here, I, I worked in the high school newspaper. I was in the high school debate team. I know you'll be shocked to hear that. But then again, there's another story there because I was on the high school debate team in Capenia State until I got thrown out for possession of something. But <laughs> 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 there's their start darkness in the past, too. No. Anyway, so I went ahead and joined the army and I knew that they had newspapers in the army. I, was uh -huh. like, I could join the army and I'd write for them. I mean, you know, who cares? I, I can get integrity later. I can just go right and uh, get paid. So I go in and I'm not going to, you know, the old saw, my recruiter lied to me. Right, right. <laughs> they, my they my recruiter do. did not lie to me. And here's the beauty. And people don't understand this. And it's like, I, I feel like there needs to be a PSA out there. The recruiter can't do shit for you. The right. recruiter can tell you what you're technically qualified for and right. make recommendations. But then you go to a place called MEPS, 
Right. It's like military entry processing something. I'm guessing I don't remember the name. But anyway, recruiters cannot. There's literally a line and the recruiters are not allowed to cross it. Like they all stand there, wait for you to come out. But when you go in there, those mofos can lie. Right. Do. So when I went in, I took the ASVAB test and whatever else. And I apparently did fine on it. You know, there, there's a list of jobs in the army and I could do any job I wanted to in the entire army. How'd you, and did you, were you a good student in school, obviously then? No, I was horrible. Oh, then how could you do any job in the army? Did you just test well? Yes. Yeah, I had, the, I had the highest GT score in any installation I've ever been on. Oh, wow. So I, 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 I'm, I'm, it's not like a brag point. There's actually a nightmare. Right. Um, I just have, and it's weird because they ha- they care about specific skills and my reading and basic math ability because I'm I suck beyond like I failed algebra, but the skills they were looking at, I matched up with. Other right. skills I probably sucked at, but right. ones that make up GT general tech, I was right up there. It was like 129, and I don't know what the ceiling is. I've heard that that was the top. I heard there's 130. I don't really know. I've, I've met one person with the same DT score and we are the highest on the installation. And this is for general technology. Is that what that stands for? It's just a portion of the ASVAB. Like we all had to take the ASVAB and right. then they parse it and say, this is the score we want to say that you qualify for whatever, whatever job. It's all GT. Right. Okay. Anyway, so I did that. But when I went into maps, they said there were only four jobs in the army. <laughs> Okay. You know, things, are, things are tough for the army, you know, and so they can only recruit for infantry, infantry, engineering, and by the way, engineering sounds good, right? Different. No, engineering means laying barbed wire and land right. Models, folks. Right. <laughs> it's not what you think. I think a mechanic and cook. But good news, the cook came with like a $3,000 bonus. Uh huh. And I had no money. Right. And they, of course, assured me that, well, you know what, you take the one, the bonus. And then when they see your skills, when you hit the base, you just go right over the paper and you know do special duty. No problem. Right. right. Yeah. Okay. So I took the one, the bonus. And thus the nightmare began. Because in the army, if you take a job that is a bonus, you're called a bonus baby. And a bonus baby is always attached to his mother, the MOS. You cannot work outside of it. Oh, so right. I quite literally was doing freelance for the post paper, producing as much as any staff member on it, interviewing literally the base commander himself uh-huh. for that. We had a contest at the time called the Connolly. It's like the best cook in the army. Uh-huh. And the Sergeant major who came out of being a cook, used me to write articles about that that helped them win the Conway. So we got the best mess all in the army. All the time saying, yeah, we'll, we'll let you move over. Meanwhile, blocking me at every turn. Then when I have to go in and do the cook job, well, this is how I got introduced to my unit. I reported to the unit with you know, a couple other privates and the first sergeant's there. And of course, our guy who brought us in, I don't know what they call him anymore. It's like receiving. It's been so long. Right. But he goes, Hey, top, this guy's got a higher GT than you. Like, Oh, great. Oh yeah. Who is this? Anyway. So then I go arrive at where I have to cook in the army. If you screw up in any of your jobs, you get reclassed as a cook. Right. Cook, cook is the bottom. Okay. Right. I know. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. There's nowhere to go. <laughs> there's nowhere to go. But just because it is the least qualified people in the world doesn't mean you know how to do the damn job. Right. So anytime I would go and I would be like, how do I do such and such? I would hear back, you have the GT, you figure it out. Back to self reliance. All right. Oh yeah, well, kind of. But yeah. Just uh, I, I, I would call that involuntary. <laughs> so, yeah, that's right. <laughs> if you will. But ironically, obviously, I hated that. I hated everything about the cook, and I hated the wearing the goofy ass white uniform. I couldn't walk around like another soldier. Even I felt humiliated and used and angry and bitter. 
And mm. to make things worse, I was stationed at Fort Irwin, California. Right. Fort Irwin, California is strategically placed where Barstow is the nearest town. Now, check this out. Barstow to the base proper is like around, I don't know, 45, 50 miles. Right. But some ass figured out that they'd have to pay extra money if people live too far away. So they bought a little island of land and they stuck a guard shack in the middle of the long ass road going out there. So it was like 31 miles to the guard shack before you drive another 20 something miles. So it doesn't count, right? Yeah. So they managed to screw us out of that. And then, by the way, there was a backlog for on post housing for a year. Right. So as an E1 private, the lowest level out there had to live off base almost an hour away. And my work shift started at four in the morning every other day. Don't recommend it to your friends. It's in the middle of the desert, 120 degrees by 10 a.m. Awful. So it was the worst job in the Army, in the worst duty station in the Army. I hit gold. I mean, I was batting a 1,000 for garbage, I'm telling you. But ironically, it probably in the end was a good thing, even though I damn sure hated it every step of the way. because. I had to deal with it. I could yeah. not escape it. I could not do anything. I hated it in the kitchen. So I volunteered to be in the field. At least in the field, I got to wear a uniform. Didn't have to go into town. If I'm crashing out there on a tent, that's cool. Got away from the cooking and started to work on the gasoline burners. Right. And, and kind of like found a side job. Got my driver's license out there. And the driver's license became super important to me later. Because having a military driver's license. Oh, yeah. Big deal. Yeah. So doing that, and I still hated, you know, everything I did. And what was really interesting about it, though, is I volunteered to invade Haiti to get out of there. Right. I mean, I, I, dude, I hated it. Okay. I wound up in Cuba. So nothing in my army career was straightforward. Okay. Right. Wound up in Cuba, did that, and it was to take care of migrants. But guess what? I had that driver's license. Right. So I managed to shift my way that, yeah, I had to work on the stoves, but I could drive. They were kind of short. So I was delivering the stuff to everybody. So I managed to get away from cooking for a couple hours every shift. You know, start the shift, go deliver, then go work, you know, whatever, try to sham as much as I could, and right. then go drive again. And then later on, it was like, okay, well, I'm already a driver. I managed to pick up a forklift. So then all of a sudden I'm working rations and another job. So with as much as I hated it, it did tell me to start looking around. How do I find this path? How do I find that path? And a significant lesson came back because remember I told you when I was told you have the GT, you figure it out. Right. That same individual recommended me for Sergeant. That was my next question was, was it just skills that did all these things? Or did you have a relationship or two that helped some of these things start happening? He ironically, and I think it was kind of one of those weird, great lessons in life, but he said, he recommended for me for Sergeant, which shocked me. And he said, I have never seen anyone hate something as much as you do and still work their ass off. Nice. How did they know you hated it so much? <laughs> I think it's pretty clear. Were you vocal? I was I vocal. I, I put in every request to the commander. I had literally a colonel say, I had a signed off approval to put me on special duty on the newspaper. And that colonel changed command. And that son of a bitch, Sergeant Major, who used me, uh -huh. spiked it personally. Uh -huh. So I, I got to learn a little bit about dirty politics being used, everything. So no, it was- But you still dove deep and worked hard though, yes? Is, is what well, you said? Well, if I had to do a job, I would do the job. Right. Even though I hated it, there's enough pride that, you know, like right. cleaning up, I'm not going to leave it looking like garbage. Right. And if I'm going to prep something, I'm not going to, I'm not going to embarrass myself. So I, I would work. And right. if it's, you know, if I'm going to load a truck, I don't want to take all day. So I would load as, you know, Fast as anybody else, I would be the first guy loading it with anybody else there. Right. You don't have to love something to do it. Right. 
<laughs> but but that was an interesting lesson that he actually observed that. I mean, and that dude, right. oh my guts. And I, I I didn't like him at all. I, I was from, from Arizona. He was somebody from the South. He had a you know the grits in his mouth right accent so i could uh, barely understand him half the time right and so that just really shattered because i'd have to keep asking what what and it's right. like you're mocking me oh no it was very very tough but what's ironic because all of this stuff like i, I told you in cuma it's like okay all of a sudden i'm driving i get the forklift i'm starting to figure things out because of all this stuff so i did re-enlist one time huh. now in the army in order to change your job or your duty station, you can re-enlist, but you can only do one. So I had the problem of what do you do when you have the worst job in the army and the worst duty station? How do you get rid of both? Right. Well, I did something that is kind of odd. I picked a job I didn't really care about, but it wouldn't necessarily bother me that didn't exist except huh. in specific places right and one of those places was fort story virginia which is nicknamed camp story when i right. and this job was literally only at fort eustace or fort story and what job is that stevedore 88 hotel it's a loading ships and planes okay you know loading the equipment strapping it down right. all that stuff i didn't really care it's like okay whatever no um, you know that's it's just something and I signed up for that job, went through the advanced training or whatever, but now I've, now I've learned something here. I've learned, okay, there's a system. System's going to work against you, or maybe you can sneak around a little bit in the system. If you know the parameters of what to do, Fort Eustis is in Newport News, Fort Stories in Virginia Beach. There's a, a bridge tunnel between the two, you know, for the south side and north side. You lived in Chesapeake for a while, so you know yep. exactly what I'm talking about. Yep. Okay. But when I moved out here, I deliberately moved to a cheap ass apartment in Ocean View. And that's Norfolk, Virginia, which is on the south side. Good pronunciation, by the way. Oh, Norfolk, yeah. Anyway, Norfolk, Norfolk. <laughs> <laughs> I picked it up. <laughs> it's on the south side and involves the British Tunnel. So, because in AIT, you could live out, out off base. Right. So, I did that. And then went to school at Fort Eustis, which is in Newport News. But I let it be known that I happened to live on the south side. So when the assignments came down, it was like, well, you already live down there. So just put him a story. Right. So that was my first little shifting move. I did the move. I set myself in an area and then it was just more convenient for everybody involved to just assign me there. It doesn't matter. No skin off their nose but I got exactly where I wanted to be. Then when I went there, I got very lucky. I, I do pretty well with academic stuff if I really, you know, if I try or whatever. And the military's not the hardest stuff to pass, folks. Right. So, but so I was like honor grad, you know, top of the class, blah, 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 whatever. When I reported to my unit, the squad, they immediately had to go into a training run. It's like something they do every year. Most of the years to spend being bored at the, in the uh, motor pool. Right. You think of the army as a lot of us sitting around doing nothing. Right. And checking vehicles that are always perfect because you've checked them the day before and they never drive. Right. But anyway, this, uh, this is all peacetime army. Uh, I'm talking in the nineties. Right. So I got put on this task to load a ship and because of my rank, I was an E4 promotable. This is another interesting part. It was very easy to pick up rank being a cook. You know, lots of open room above. A lot right. of cooks need everywhere. So I managed to get the rank of E4 promotable in line for sergeant. Then I changed my job into a, an MOS that was just locked down hard. Right, right. Well, I had passed the point of being a sergeant as a cook so i technically was promoted meaning like i had done everything but gone to the one class i had to do to be a sergeant right changed the mos so now he was effectively a, effectively a sergeant in waiting right and fortunately they didn't get too pissed off but i mean we're talking it took people 12 years to become sergeant over there it right was really really bad but i was a squad leader when I got there 
for that assignment, I just had come out of training and I, I tackled the same way I did in Cuba or for or winter where I just worked my ass off. Right. You know, anything that anybody was doing, I was doing myself as hard and fast as I could. We nailed everything. And the platoon leader is so happy at the work. He said, oh, I'm sending you a PLDC. So I was in PLDC like within one month of getting there. And that is what? Primary leadership development training. They call it right. something else now, I heard. And, and I was a sergeant, like in no time. And where it gets interesting is they had a side project that they needed to do, which is building a boardwalk. And so I got assigned that special duty. And the, the irony is, unlike being a cook, the only time I was ever a stevedore or my MOS was right. that one assignment on that ship that got me to sergeant. Right. And in training. Because then after I did the boardwalk and was successful building that out with people, I became the training NCO for the company. Hmm. And, you know, I'd handle like PT tests and stuff like that. And and I just wrote that out and then you know, I just finished the career and left, if you will. Yeah. So I, I don't know if all this makes sense. It's, it's really fascinating. Because it's a part of who you are and understanding who you are today is it's important to see where it came from because it explains a lot. And it's, it's I always like trying to draw out, you know, how you forge trust along the way, because none of these things happens alone mm -hmm. or in, in a vacuum. And you obviously made and roads because you made people's lives easier by the hard work you did in your job. And whether mm -hmm. someone likes you or not, a lot of times when you make their lives easier because you're doing your job so well, it mm -hmm. forges a relationship of trust. Cause trust isn't, I always like to highlight trust isn't necessarily likability. It's mm -hmm. actually predictability mm -hmm. and where people I feel see. safe. And so you were forging trust along the way because you were very predictable you might not have liked your job and you even if you're vocal about it or not, it doesn't matter because you were predictably competent at what you're doing, no matter what they gave you to do. So mm -hmm. who wouldn't want you part of that team, which gives you amazing, as you experience, flexibility to maneuver in any direction you wanted to. Yeah. At least it looks that way. So how's that come back then to you you started your career or your life? interviewing and writing because i never do what i'm supposed to do right? I <laughs> which i love so how did it finally come back to getting back into interviewing and your second or your second or third life well okay but there's a bridge there because when i left the army i went to work for gateway i don't know if you remember gateway 2000 they were you know hot computer with the oh yeah program. i do remember gateway computers <laughs> well a typical experience in my life is when i was in the army I was a training NCO. Because I'm I'm a little OCD about stuff. Uh huh. I had to put up a a presentation about some training that was going on for higher command. And this is a weird part too, because I and this goes into some of the body language, you know, whatever. Because I was almost always the lowest ranking person in any briefing room. Mm -hmm. I don't know why it kept working out that way, but it just kind of was so. You'd have captains presenting and then I'd be presenting. And you were a Marine. You understand the discrepancy there. All right. But I, I would do it. So I, I did this presentation as a PowerPoint because, oh, my God, PowerPoint. Oh, it was so sacred in the 90s. It was everything. You know, PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. Ooh, you got a PowerPoint. It was sexy. Well, I did it. I took these images and my wife at the time helped me get a scanner. I got a handheld scanner and mm -hmm. actually installed the card in the computer myself. And it was a big deal to me then, but I would scan images. And then, you know, when you scan things and you have the colors wrong, so it's like an off white on a white, and it just looks like garbage. Right. And I can't stand that. I get, ugh. So I'm sitting there by the pixel going, click, 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 removing pixels, just trying to make it look as neat as possible. Right. And because my slides look neater than other people's, that meant I knew everything about computers. <laughs> that's the logic of the time, okay? It's great <laughs> <Okay>. logic. <laughs> Whatever. That's, that's military logic. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> and, and the thing is, so then all of a sudden, the captain's computer's not working, and I'm tasked to fix it. And I'm like, okay, so I'm on the phone with Gateway, you know, fixing the computer and everything. Anyway, so long story short, I suddenly was a computer technician, and then I was dumb enough to believe my own press and I applied to work for Gateway. Uh-huh. And I got in. And actually, again, I weird maneuvering, but 
I was only there for six months, but when I was there, I think after the first month, I went on a special team where, uh, I not what they called it, but I was kind of like the, um, the guy they called with a customer that was so bad that they had a lawsuit pending or their VIP or whatever it was. It was like the, the worst toxic, bad customer relationship problem. I think it was like emergency response or something, whatever it was. But you know, I, I was the guy and my job was to get them to just go away, you know, best way possible. Right. And it's actually a proud achievement that I never replaced a computer my entire time. <laughs> and I had like 75 year old ladies. Now I'm not trying to be ageist, but at the time there was a definite age right, right. taking apart their own computers and working with me all the way through and resolving these issues. It could take me six hours, eight hours, you know, whatever. And right. so it was this weird special task force. So I think that, that helps, you know, with, communication and getting along with others or whatever if you know we're starting out already in really bad shape here right <laughs> you don't like the company you have nothing but n nastiness you know lawsuit whatever and we just work through it and i did that but then that that reputation i had for being the computer guy wound up being known by a communications guy in our battalion who had retired and picked up a job at nextel and he reached out to me because he had heard that I was in the area. Right. And all of a sudden I picked, I doubled my salary within six months of getting the job. So it was, it, this is part of the building connections, if you will, and never a straight path. I don't know if that makes sense, but anyway. Yes, it does. And see, when I say Renaissance, man, I'm not talking about art or sculpting. I'm talking about this. <laughs> you are all over the place becoming a master of what you touch because whether you liked it or not, it was part of what you had to do to survive and to thrive in wherever you wound up being. Yes. Essentially. Yeah. And, and it, I guess it goes from there. I worked at gateway and then all the way up to the knock, like network operations center, working uh -huh. with routers and stuff, overnight shift, had a bad experience, got fired, had to move to Tucson and this is where things got really, really crazy is in uh, Tucson with the parents, I was like, well, you know, I, I picked up these different certificates when I was working. I, so you went back home to your parents. Yeah. I, I, yep. you know, okay. I just verifying the location. Yep. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. Back, back there with them. Yep. And I had heard that they were looking for people to teach tech courses at university of Arizona extended U. Right. I, don't, I never got a degree in all this, but, you know, I did, I was like a master CNE, which is a certified Nobel engineer and an MCSA, Microsoft stuff, Cisco stuff. I, I could test, I test really well. I always right. have done that. So I managed to actually talk my way into teaching a course and then they never quite had enough people. So that course over the next couple of years one year, I wound up teaching 29 different subjects in one year. <laughs> and the the importance of this job is that was the first job that this happened with and everything since. Every job I've ever had now since 2000 has been created from my resume. Right. So rather than a job description that I fit in, every job description has been written to hire me. And why is that? It's just the way it worked out because like to work for the school, because I did go on the U of A payroll for oh, a bit. Why do people want you so bad? Well, hopefully I have skills they need, or I fit a particular slot that's very difficult to- I think uh, it's it's got to be more than that, Eric. I mean, he, anyone can flip a switch. There's got to be a reason why people are writing job skills and, and, and a position for you. What is it? Any idea? I I fit something they need. <laughs> that's it right you're solving a pain point but mm -hmm. is it a is it a is it a technical pain point you're solving or is it something deeper or more I, i'm gonna say usually it's a technical or it's often been a technical pain point i think it's moving more into a personality point now right. because now like i i've known you for a few years i, I put you with jack barsky and i love doing that 
So right. it's, it's funny because I, I love to introduce you and I never ask you about it. I, I never say, hey, how's Jack? No, it's just like, boom, boom, oh, and I just set people up and I move on. So I don't know what it is. I do, but I, I love to help people. You solve, I pro- well, I see it as you solve technical, yes, but you solve problems through networks, through relationships and people like you and they like you well enough that they keep contact. And, and when you... It doesn't sound like you've really ruined relationships ever because you're able to go reach back in time and grab them and bring them forward and as if no time had passed. I mean, you're, you're a problem solver. That's that's what it sounds like you do really, really well, which then goes back to your way back when, when you liked reading and writing and talking, which kinds of, mm-hmm. I, when I see you podcasting now, it sounds like you took all these great life experiences and it's come back full circle to what your what your joy is, and that is discovering strange and interesting things in people. Yes, maybe I'm just I'm always striving to maybe finally fit in. <laughs> that sounds about right. So why, where are you trying to fit in with the cool kids? I'm usually <laughs> I, I use a real estate analogy because like I, uh-huh. I I'm I'm good friends with David Fryheit, who's a Viva Fry, very large YouTuber. I've known him for a while. He wasn't as big, but He's a huge channel. And I do a show with Nate, the lawyer, another big YouTube. All these lawyers, I don't, it, it, it must be a problem. I'm, I'm actually seeking out in life. I got to have lawyers around me and spooks and FBI people. Never know. <laughs> anyway, for some uh, reason, you think they're the cool people. I like them. I like intellectually nimble people who are going to challenge me. Right. I like that intellectually nimble. Yes. I don't know why you like me then. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, and people who don't believe their own their own press, if you will, like like right humility. I part of the reason I get on so well with Nate uh-huh. is we argue all the time. Ah, oh, cool. But we love it, right? So, so we're like laughing as we're arguing, intellectual sparring. Yes, it is. It is fun, and we don't take it seriously. And I right. find that lawyers. The really good ones just like that intellectual challenge. That that, that that profession, as they pick it, I think if they are doing it sincerely with the mindset, it is quite literally they're advocating for a position which may or may not be their own position, but they have to intellectually be able to carry both sides of a position. And I want people like that who, even if we're going to disagree in the end, can you recognize my life experience and can I recognize your life experience enough to appreciate you for who you are? So maybe I don't agree with our conclusion, but I can still appreciate you. And right. in that sense, I might, I might've been able to do your job a little, I don't know about understanding the people that I'm trying to recruit or, you know, I, less I think you would have been much better than me. What I've <laughs> seen is people like you, Jordan, and Dove Baron, these people that have interviewed hundreds, if not thousands of people are the most amazing at understanding and connecting. You know how to make it about the other person, inspire them to share, inspire trust, because it's you are the best recruiters of human beings. I mean, I've ever seen it's, it's humbling because you do more interviews than any FBI agent will ever do. Guaranteed. Hmm. Yeah, but you have paperwork. <laughs> Fortunately, I don't have that. So you're so I was hindered by paperwork, which kept me from doing more of it. Yes. And someone else is telling me what I had to find out rather than exploring my own curiosity. So I think yes. that's why this part is so good and enjoyable. So Eric, how do you define happiness then? What makes you happy? Believe it or not, I love what I'm doing. I would be happy if I could just do more of it. Right. My day job is my distraction. I hate it. You know, talking to you makes me think about things. It's like, there's another pattern of behavior I have that's like, oh, that makes sense now. Yeah. And it actually may represent what I've done with work and other things. And that was, I was always poor and I could never afford things, but I wanted things. So I learned how to trade up. Yep. I learned how to find something that had value in it that I could get for next to nothing and then trade that for something else that would have the value. So eventually I would trade up to the item or thing that I wanted. Right. Maybe that's what I've been doing with jobs. That's kind of brings me to the final question I want to go to. And that is how do you, cause you're really good at this. How do you prepare to do a great interview? What does Eric do? Well, there's preparation and then there's during. 
And it's it does two different things because Let, let's go. Let's focus on the because the the preparation it, it, you do an amazing amount of preparation. I don't think anyone could ever match you. You and Jordan are are the prep, preppers of the world. How do you do it during? Because that takes a that takes a huge observational skill set. And I've seen the, the best people in the world. You know, matter of fact, Joe Navarro's book "Be Exceptional." The second element is awareness. And I think to be a great interviewer, you have to be completely present as well as aware. There you go. How do you do that? Give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> the next quotable quote. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I, I, I mean, some of this stuff it sounds lame, but some of it is kind of a, if you actually care, you will be there and you will be present. I, I mean, it, it's not, it's not a high level rocket science. And so I think that's a good way to kind of do our last theme here is the consequences of human behavior. What do you see as uh, that you've learned through that, that uh, could facilitate someone else having better interaction with humans? Well, okay. Well, Jim Pyle's a good source for this, but it's true. Ask questions like you're a little kid. That's, I like that. Yeah. And that's straight from him. That's his, his formula and it's, it's brilliant. I don't, I think you've written about in your book. I think Carnegie has, I, I think everybody, but liking, mm. if I like you, you're probably going to like me if I, I care enough to like you. And, 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 and I guess I'm going to break it down a little further. One thing I found out is everybody's awesome. Everybody has a story. They just don't know they have a story. Because it's their story and it's boring because it's their story. They've lived right. it. Okay. They know about it, but I haven't heard it. Were you always non-judgmental of someone else's story or did you have to learn it? I mean, I'm judgmental. Everybody's judgmental. You know, it's like, I like to say that I'm not judged, but no, that's bullshit. I, I'm judgmental. And then I back off of myself, you know, so I, I, I don't know how to explain it. I, I try not to take myself too seriously, but my initial reaction internally may be, really? But then it's like, oh, get over yourself, Eric. Who are you? <laughs> so th 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 I, I don't want to sit there and pretend it's like, oh, I'm this monk. No, I'm an ass. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but, I mean, but, but then I, I try to say, okay, but but then I know I'm an ass. So then it's like, okay, let me let me step back and then say, why is that? Then I then I I try to find an interest in it. it it's kind of like a reverse marketing, right? Same way as I, I'm like I know there's a story there. How can I shape that? How can I pull that out? Oh. Sounds like the the magic secret sauce is curiosity and humility. Okay, see, I don't <laughs> have the good words for it, <laughs> Eric. Is there anything you think I should have asked you that I didn't ask you that you'd love to be able to share? No, I think we're good. I love <laughs> that question too. That That's a great sheet at the end. Eric, this has been amazing. It's been informational. Thank you for opening up and sharing. I'll tell you, having a story about your mother joined a cult was not what I was ever anticipating. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. But it under, it, the cult members. No. What's, what's so fascinating, and that's why I hope everyone takes away from this, and I'll say it so you don't have to say it. Please check out Eric's Unstructured Podcast because if you're fascinated by how people interact and just have great conversations and allow people to feel safe, allow people to feel valued, and to demonstrate how – Everyone has this greatness in them. Check out his podcast. Go deep, don't judge, and be curious. And so, Eric, thanks for coming on the show and sharing. <laughs> oh, thank you, man. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Forge by Trust. If you enjoyed the show, took away a few new tools, I hope you'll click like and leave a great review of the show to show your support. If you're interested in more information about how I can help you forge your own trust-building communication interpersonal strategies for yourself or your organization, please visit my website at www.peopleformula.com. I'm looking forward to sharing my next Forge by Trust episode with you next week when we chat with the amazing Jessica Kriegel about unleashing the power of culture.